Hey, I'm Scott. And I'm Chris. And this is Doxologic, where we help you think with your Bible. Well, welcome back to another episode of Doxa Logic. And listeners, today we have got a real treat for you. Uh, something that I would argue, Scott, uh, is a topic that needs a lot of um, kind of deep thinking before you can really responsibly address this topic. Mm-hmm. Something that you and I have studied, you know, thinking seminary days and all that. And yet, uh, for for what I'm going to call the common man, the, the mm-hmm. Christian who's like, man, I need a deeper understanding of this subject, but I don't have the time to get mm-hmm. into it. We get the chance to talk to someone today who has taken that time, and so I'll let you cue that up. Yes, we are going to talk today about the problem of evil and just um. Evil in general. And uh, Chris, this is a question that comes up uh, from our listeners on Doxologic all the time. Right. Some version of where did evil come from? How do we respond to evil? What's the best biblical take on it? There's many uh, defenses or theories you know, about how to explain evil. And so we have a real treat because coming out of COVID, uh, our church did a series called Now Concerning. Yep. And we essentially took kind of the 10 most pressing questions uh, on the hearts of our our church members, and uh, we addressed those questions, and one of them was on precisely this. And so there was a message that was uh, done all the way back in June of 2021 called Evil and God's Goodness, and it was all about this issue of the problem of evil. And one of the best resources, if not the best resource that came up, was this behemoth, uh, What About Evil? by Scott Christensen. And so today, we have the privilege of having Scott Christensen on the podcast. Scott, how are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing great. Glad you're here, sir, and thank you for joining us. And I'll put your second book on the screen, which has a far slimmer uh, look <laughs> exactly. to it than the behemoth yeah, of... Let me, let me get the pages on this, Chris. So, yeah, yeah, let's do that. Right. Uh, um, first of all, that's bigger pages, uh, not to mention many more. Um, are we talking back, no less. This is big. This is about 500 pages. 500 pages. We have 215 here. Scott, maybe start with... These are not necessarily two different books, but the one I'm holding up... Uh, um, defeating Evil is uh, newer, just came out. Maybe just explain to us how that came out, and then we'll get going on some of your background. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, you know, when the big book came out in 2020 was when it was released. Um, probably the most common question I got from readers and others who were familiar with it and looked at how thick the book was and said, yeah, I ain't, I ain't tackling that. Uh, sure. You know, the, the first question that came out is when are you going to do the, the reader's digest version? And, uh, you know, and so eventually my, my publisher saw the need to do something that would be more accessible, a lot less technical language, a little less, acad- you know, I, I didn't really intend the first book to be real academic. Um, but it kind of ended up being a little bit academic just because it is a difficult topic to tackle. And so you can't avoid some of the important discussions that go on, you know, among theologians and philosophers and whatnot. So I felt like I really had to address that in a way that was still accessible. But for most people in the church, you know, people sitting in the pew, they're not going to tackle that big, thick book. And so I wanted something, uh, really saw the need for something that you could hand to a fellow believer who's, you know, probably not going to spend the time to tackle the large book. Sure. So, so this book called Defeating Evil is the newest one. We'll get uh, this one linked in the show notes as well as the original one. So, listener, you can take your pick. Uh, are you the type that wants the 500 pages? Spare me nothing, not a single page or idea. Or do would you say, give me a bit of that condensed version? I will say in a matter of three or four days, I got about two thirds, maybe a little more than that through this newest uh, book. Uh, Looking forward to talking, wanting to be familiar with what your argument was going to be. And before we get into that, maybe just a little bit of your background, Uh, not even a full life story per se, but just some of your upbringing, uh, coming to Christ, and then tell us about some of your ministry background. Yeah, no, I I did not really grow up in a Christian home. I went to nominally Lutheran church when I was young. My parents were divorced when I was five. Uh, my mom actually came out of very strong Christian background, um, strong Christian family, but she kind of rejected her faith when she was in high school and eloped and and um, and had, had three boys. I was her second 
son. And, uh, but her family started praying for us and, um, and her brother, who was a pastor, uh, convinced her to start taking us to church when I was eh, seven, eight years old and, uh, and started going to, eventually started going to a Christian school and, uh, Lord really convicted me at a young age. And I think I got saved probably when I was about 11 or 12, but wasn't in a real environment to really grow as a Christian. That didn't happen until my later high school, early college years when I had a kind of difficult experience that really drove me to my knees. And, uh, and that's re- really when I started getting serious about my faith. And, um, and right from the get-go, just got very involved in ministry. I was involved in leadership and ministry in, in college and got out of college, worked as an architect for many years and uh, got involved in my church, little church in Colorado, Aspen, Colorado, and uh, started teaching classes, started started uh, preaching, got involved in leadership there. And, uh, and then eventually the Lord called me into ministry. And uh, so I left my architectural career and moved to California, got married, moved mm. to California, had, had my oldest son and uh, went to the master seminary, uh, spent four and a half years there and uh, had another son growing, have four sons now, but, uh, but yeah, been, uh, did an internship in, in a church for a couple of years. And then I pastored a small church in Southwest Colorado for 16 years. And, um, and then the Lord called us into a different kind of ministry. Just felt like my giftedness led me more toward an associate pastor role. And so, so that led me to Kerrville Bible Church in Kerrville, Texas. And I've been here for four and a half years and, uh, we love it. Great church, great, uh, great place to live. And, uh, it's not the mountains of Colorado, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, sure. yeah, the Lord's really blessed our church here and the ministry here. And, um, and, and, and during all that time, he's opened the doors for me to write, write a few books. Scott, just thinking about your ministry background, even making that transition to Texas, is that, was that part of, um, was your writing part of the consideration for making that kind of change? Were you able to maybe emphasize that or focus on that more or was writing something that has always been there and you, you've just kind of thought that's definitely a way the Lord's going to use me? No, uh, the, the writing was not in the, was really not part of the consideration to move, make the move to Texas. In fact, uh, at my ministry in Colorado, which was a little bit more laid back, I uh, actually had a lot more time to write, and uh, which is why you see the big thick book. I, you know, is able to pour more of myself into into writing and. Uh, and and so my ministry here is a little bit more rigorous and uh, doesn't afford me quite as much time to write as I would love, but um, but I fit it in when I can. And um, but but yeah, it's just never really never really had an ambition to be a writer. I just kind of just kind of came out that way. Um, mm. Was it the subject in particular that struck you because? Would you agree there's not a ton on a popular level with a good theologically robust defense of how to understand the problem of evil? Yeah. Well, my first book, uh, which is called What About Free Will, um, I I had to tackle a little bit of that issue in one of the chapters there. And uh, because when you're dealing with the question of God's sovereignty and human freedom and responsibility— Inevitably, you're going to intersect questions of evil and and whatnot in the world, and and how do we assign moral culpability, you know, for evil in the world? And that's the basic problem of evil. Uh, you know, if we have an all powerful, all sovereign God who is also omnibenevolent, all good and wise, then why would such a God? allow evil to exist in the world and who's responsible for it. Um, and so that's, that's the, that's the main question when you're dealing with the problem of evil. And so, um, 
so that intersects the whole question of free will. And, uh, and so in the first book, you know, I was trying to untackle or trying to tackle the whole issue of God's sovereignty and salvation, that God chooses us for salvation, and yet he does not undermine our decision-making process. And uh, so how do we look at that whole question of free will? And you have kind of the Reformed Calvinist position, which is what I represent in my books, and then the more Arminian or what's known as a free will theist position that that um you know that i critique in 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 both books so when i wrote the first book um you know the editor and my publisher uh really felt i needed to tackle (laughs) the problem of evil head on and uh Mm. i really didn't want to (laughs) because (laughs) it is you know it is the achilles heel as many have said of the christian faith in terms of apologetics and i'm like seriously you know, I, I am totally unqualified <laughs> to uh, to tackle this subject, but he convinced me to do it. And uh, so I spent five years working on that book and reading everything that I thought was relevant that I could get my hands on in mm. uh, researching it and just trying to get my own mind around it and and then kind of framing what I felt was the best way to approach it. Mm. Well, that's great. Let's let's jump into uh, some of this very conversation now um, with maybe starting here, a working definition. What would you say is a working definition of evil? Well, uh, there's, there's really two prongs to our understanding of evil. One is what we would call moral evil, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And then the other is what we might call natural evil. And from a biblical perspective, we would say both the existence of moral evil and natural evil came from the curse in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned and rebelled against God and uh, and engaged in moral evil and therefore also uh, put a curse of evil upon all of Adam's progeny so that the Bible would indicate that we are all born into sin. We are all born with a corrupted nature and a tendency toward moral evil. Uh, and so when you're defining moral evil, it, it, the, the simplest way to define it is, is it is any violation or transgression of God's moral law that he has written upon our hearts that reflects his own moral character. So it's not as though God came up with a bunch of arbitrary moral rules. Um, no, the 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 righteousness, the moral integrity that the Bible describes we should have uh, is a reflection of the moral integrity, the moral righteousness of God Himself, mm-hmm. and uh, and so any violation of the moral commands that God gives us is a violation of the character of God himself. So that would be moral evil. Natural evil is one of the consequences, we might say, of moral evil uh, that took place in the garden in which there was a curse upon the whole cosmos, upon the whole creation, in which death entered into the creation and corruption entered into the creation. And we have all these kinds of natural evils, such as tornadoes and earthquakes, natural disasters. We have death and disease, uh, COVID-19, we've got, you know, we have, uh, you know, accidents that take place, you know, rocks tumble off of cliffs and crush cars, you know, on the road. Mm -hmm. And these aren't the results of moral evil. They're the results of natural evil of a corrupted creation, a corrupted cosmos that we live in. uh, That's not the way it's supposed to be. It's not the way God initially designed it or intended it, but it became that uh, as a result of the curse that we see in Genesis 3 uh, after the fall of Adam and Eve. Hmm. That's helpful. Yeah, that is good. What are some of the, um, 
what are some of the prevailing misconceptions? Uh, and I know there's probably a lot, right? It's uh, I imagine with a lot of our questions today, you you would say, well, how much time do you have, right? Because <laughs> I could give an expanded definition, or I could try to really address just what you're maybe asking, right? So yeah. uh, recognizing when I say prevailing misconceptions, there are plenty. But what are some of the ones that you would say are most common and or maybe most detrimental um, in the lives of Christians that you would you would seek to correct um, through your through your work um, about evil and, and God's goodness? Yeah, I would say that that probably the most common myth or common misperception in terms of the problem of evil, you know, it, it has to do with our view of God and of course human responsibility. And it's the idea that, and I believe this comes from all perspectives, no matter what your theological orientation is. If you're a Calvinist or an Arminian, I think both, if they're honest with themselves, are going to struggle with this. And and it's the idea that how can God really truly escape being morally culpable for evil, um, given that he is in control? You know, even even though Calvinists and Arminians differ on their view of God's sovereignty, we all agree that God could intervene. God could put a stop to all evil. He could crush Satan right now, and Satan could have zero influence, you know, on what happens in the world today. Mm. And so the question is, why doesn't he do that? And and I think that's flabbergasting for people. And uh, and I and I think secondly and related to that is that. God appears, and I, I kind of mentioned this in both my books, that God appears to be kind of like a, a mob boss, you know, who who just says, you know, all right, we're going to allow this to happen, or we're going to actually, you know, we're going to orchestrate this, you know, this evil thing, you know, like a divine, you know, Vito Corleone from, you know, from uh, mm. The Godfather or something like that. And, and we look at God as like the divine Godfather. Yeah, he just orders all this terrible stuff to happen, you know. And therefore, how can he escape being culpable for evil? And I think, particularly for those who come from the Reformed Calvinist position, which which I do, um, that is the most common objection: is that it, it makes God, you know, seem to, you know, be the author of evil. It, it, it seems that we're just these sort of, uh, you know, puppets dangling, you know, on the strings, you know, where God is up there, you know, you know, it's interesting that even the Godfather book has, you know, has like these puppet strings, you know, mm-hmm. uh, the marionette puppets. Yeah, yeah the little right. marionettes. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I think that's the most common misconception is that if you believe that God is all sovereign and in control of the world, uh, and and especially in a meticulous kind of way, so that as like R.C. Spro- Sproul said, there's no maverick molecule in the universe. Every molecule has its place and purpose in God's design and in the unfolding of history. And and there's nothing outside of God's control. There's nothing outside of His sovereign purposes. And so um, it's really hard for people, of no matter what your theological persuasion, to get your mind around that. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So I guess that kind of ties in a little bit to this other term that comes up. So the problem of evil is maybe how it's said in the mainstream, but theodicy, the idea of theodicy. Uh, theos being the word for God, dikaios being the word for righteousness. In the Greek Justice yeah, in yeah. the Greek, and it's that whole idea of a, def- a defense of how God can be just and allow evil in the right. universe. And when you think about theodicy, uh, and I think your book, uh, What About Evil, the, the Big Dog, uh, mentions the four sort of options on this, you know, the free will defense, that, you know, God opens the door, gives us free will, he takes a risk, and yeah. uh, but it could bring on evil, and it did, or natural law you know, defense that you mentioned, the best of all possible worlds defense, and then the, you know, the greater glory defense. Um, can you kind of walk us through um, those perspectives and yeah. just how do you, how you deal with them? Yeah. So, you know, the natural law defense is somewhat related to the free will defense, but it's almost a kind of separate category 
because it's not dealing with moral evil, it's dealing with natural evil. And, it, and basically, the natural law defense is a way to handle all of these natural evils. And, and that basically, you know, when God created the laws of nature, that, you know, when we misuse those laws, you know, they're going to bring about bad consequences. You know, um, if we don't respect those laws, you know, they, they'll, you know, when you stand at the busy street, you know, you don't run out in front of a Mack truck. That's going to bring about some natural evil uh, all across the roadway. And uh, and we don't want that. So so, mm. you know, respect the laws of nature. I, I think there's some problems with that because God could create a world where the natural laws, the laws that govern that world would not create any pain or suffering. You know, and that's one thing that we need to make you know, to, to bring into this discussion that one of the consequences of both moral and natural evil is pain and suffering. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so that's part of the problem as well, right? And why would God want a world with such pain and suffering? Uh, but we know that God created a world, at least for a time being, that didn't have any pain and suffering in it, you know, in the garden before the fall. And he said it was very good. Uh, And then we know that there's going to be a world in the future, a new heavens and a new earth, where the curse will be done away with, as we're told in the book of Revelation and other places. And there will be no natural evil in that world either. So the question remains, why would God create a world where that does happen? And there's no necessary connection between the laws of nature um, and natural evil, you know, in terms of you know, could God have not created a world that didn't include those things? Yes, he could have. And um, and so I think some of the natural law arguments aren't taking into account the grander purposes of God and, and, and the whole unfolding of his plan of redemption. Um, you know, but so, so that I think we can set aside. When you get to the other versions of theodicies or defenses— of God, and really that's what's what we're talking about. A, a theodicy is really defending God against the charge that he is morally culpable for evil, or sometimes we might say that he is the author of evil, although I think that needs to be qualified. We could talk about that later as well. But um, but I think they really fall into two basic categories, and, and I really talk about this in the new book, because then I'll get into all the various categories, you know, the two main ways of, of approaching a problem evil is what we might call the free will defense and what we might call the greater good defense. And even like the best of all possible worlds defense or the soul making theodicy that I talk about in the big book, really those are sort of subspecies of the greater good defense. And so, so really when you narrow it down, there's two basic approaches and one is, Scott, as you mentioned earlier, the free will approach that God gave everyone free will. In other words, they have this autonomy to make good or evil choices, and God has no control over those choices by definition, or at least by their definition of free will. God could have no control. He couldn't even really know what our choices are until we make them, Uh you know, and in order for those choices to be truly free, uh, according to this brand of free will, which is technically known as libertarian free will uh, in the philosophical and theological literature. So nonetheless, that what God did is in order to escape moral culpability himself, he created these creatures with free will. And that the idea is that the value of our choices don't mean anything unless we have the equal ability to choose one or the other. So in other words, my ability to express love to my wife really has no value unless I have the equal ability to show hatred towards her. You know, she only can feel loved, we might say, if she knew that I could have made a choice to be evil toward her. Right. And so this is a basic you know, this I'm kind of simplifying, but that's a basic way sure. of defining free will. Mm-hmm. And so the idea is that God granted us this free will, and therefore in doing so, he took a huge risk that we would misuse this freedom and choose evil instead of good. 
And supposedly this then, you know, allows God to, you know, to escape being culpable for evil. So that's the one basic approach. And there's a, a, a number of variations. And sometimes some of these views are can kind of combined together as well. Uh, then the other view is a greater good view. And it's the, and this tends to be more associated with Reformed or Calvinistic views of God. And the idea is that God would never purpose evil as part of his broad plans. You know, in, in this view, God is sovereign over both good and evil. So that nothing escapes his plans. He has a plan. It includes both good and evil. And therefore, any evil that occurs in this world, whether it be natural evil or moral evil on the part of moral creatures, um, is all part of God's plan. But he would never purpose or allow or permit any evil that did not have some greater good that would occur, you know, you know, that, that it could not occur apart from the evil that it's connected to. So a, a simple, you know, simple illustration of that would be compassion, right? We might look at compassion as a tremendous virtue, maybe one of the greatest virtues, you know, and yet compassion is something that cannot be expressed unless there is some situation of misery where compassion becomes a powerful response to that, mm. right? You mm -hmm, know, mercy mm -hmm. is not a virtue to celebrate unless, you know, unless there is some condition, some adverse condition, you know, that mercy comes in and changes and brings about some greater good. Um, you know, just think of Jesus's compassion or mercy upon you know, people who were uh, demon-possessed or crippled or blind, mm -hmm. and he gives them their sight back or, you know, heals their bodies or casts out demons. You know, he's extending mercy to those individuals. Well, if they weren't in these evil conditions in the first place, there'd be no opportunity for him to display such mercy. So you might say that the display of mercy is a greater good that comes out of some mm. evil connection. In other words, you couldn't have this good called mercy unless it is connected to some adverse condition where mercy is displayed. So, mm. so those are two basic approaches. And so the idea behind the good, the greater good defense is that God always has something greater, some greater good to bring out of evil. And if he cannot do that, then he will not allow that evil to exist. Oh, I appreciate that um, walk through there, and, and Scott, you're, do you want to go somewhere right now? Well, scripture? I was just thinking about, is the crescendo moment of that defense the, you know, Jesus delivered up according to the foreknowledge of God, Acts 2, Acts 4? Yes, so certainly those that uh, affirm the greater good defense would say, yeah, that may be the supreme expression of of God's goodness. Because if you look, you know, if we look at the death of Christ, we're looking from a human perspective, we're looking at, you know, well, even the divine perspective, we're looking at the greatest evil ever perpetrated against another human being in the history of the world. Why? Because it's the only time in history that we had a truly innocent person who was condemned to death, condemned to a brutal death, such as crucifixion, uh, and and truly unjustly murdered, and so and because now we're also dealing with the very Messiah, the very God Man, God incarnate, and now human beings have crucified the God Man. Now you have really magnified that evil, and so we might make the argument that there is no greater evil. You could even look at the Holocaust or a host of any other kinds of events, and none of them compare to the intensity of the evil that was involved in the murder of Jesus Christ. And yet, we also know from Scripture that God brought about the greatest good, you know, from that. And so you're, you're alluding to the passages in, in Acts 2, you know, Peter's sermon, you know, at Passover, where he is addressing the Jews, and he says, this man 
you know, whom you crucified, you know, at the hands of godless men was a result of God's, you know, pre predetermined plan and foreknowledge, uh, you know, so that, that, you know, on the one hand, it happened at the hands of godless men, but on the other hand, it was part of the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. This was part of God's plan before he even created the world. Yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, we can talk about how there's moral culpability assigned to humans in that case and none to God. But the point is, is that he brought about this greater good himself. It was, he, you know, it was God who instigated and planned and ensured that the murder of Jesus would take place because it's at the heart of the gospel. Mm. Mm. It's it's hard for many people to get their heads around that, but it's, yeah. you know, we have to make that conclusion. And you see the same thing in, in Acts 4 as well. And there you have names, right. you know, Pontius Pilate and Herod were came together, you know, That's and right. both yeah. Jews and Gentiles involved in the murder of Jesus. So we can't just blame one person or one set of people because it was a collusion of a number sure. of different evil people that that brought about this evil event. Now, Scott, your um your the phrase that you've used is and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that you coined uh the greater glory defense. Yes. Um, I, I maybe I don't know if that's a, like a subset of the greater good or you know spinoff. However, you would describe that. Take us through some of that. The the, the greater glory defense. So, what I appreciated about the again, I, I'm I've uh, gotten far enough through the defeating evil book, the smaller one. You spend about four, if maybe five chapters um, a- analyzing, explaining. I, it seemed very fairly different views, and then analyzing and critiquing before you set up a positive expression. Yeah. You know of the greater glory defense, which I I, I, I like the outline um, of that. But take us into the word as well. Tur- turn with um, have us turn to a couple of key places where you would explain the greater glory defense. Sure, and um, and let's see that from from the word of God because I, I've been very um, compelled by what you express in the book. Yeah, sure. Let me let me just explain it, um, and then we can look at a couple of, of key passages. You know, I think, you know, first of all, the greater glory defense, it's nothing new. Uh, it really goes back to an ancient uh, theodicy uh, called the Felix Culpa, which is a Latin phrase meaning the fortunate fall or fortunate That's right. fall. That's right. So we normally yeah. think of the fall of Adam and Eve as an unfortunate occurrence, but there's an ancient hymn probably written by Ambrose, an early church father in the fourth century in which he refers to the fortunate fall of Adam and Eve because it brought about such a great and wonderful redeemer in the person of Christ. And uh, and so he didn't call it the greater glory theodicy, and others such as John Owen kind of have picked up on this um, uh, in Owen's communion with God, a uh, great Puritan uh, theologian. And, uh, and others have kind of picked up on it, but, but nobody has developed it into a full-blown kind of theodicy, as far as I know, uh, until, until I wrote my book. Uh, now, there was a philosophical defense of this by a, an important Christian philosopher named Alvin Plantinga, who wrote an article mm-hmm. a number of years ago that really influenced my thinking, and, uh, and he calls it the Felix Culpa. But he doesn't really develop it uh, into the full-blown kind of theodicy that I do in my book. So let me just walk you through, and then we can look at a couple of passages of Scripture that I think, think, you know, are are important. So so I asked the question, why did God create the world? You know, we're asking big, you know, big picture questions here. Why did God create the world? Well, he didn't have some intrinsic need to create the world. You know, God was completely self-satisfied in his own Trinitarian bliss, you know, you might say. Um, enjoying inner Trinitarian love and fellowship. Uh, He had no need. God has no needs. He didn't need to create anything. So we have to agree that God created the world out of his own sovereign freedom. Okay. And so, you know, I just asked the question, what has been historically uh, the Christian answer to why God created? And, and, And I think, 
historically throughout Christian history, we all major theologians have agreed that God created the world as a theater for the display of his own glory, that he freely chose to to create the world so that that his glory might be displayed in particular to his image bearing creatures who are us human beings. And uh, and so but I take it a step further and say that that um that I believe God created the world to supremely magnify his glory. Uh, because God could have created Eden such a place that it would not fall. He could have created Eden in such a way that it was no, there was no possibility for Adam and Eve to fall. And, and we know he could have done that because that's exactly what he will do in the new heavens and the new earth. When the redeemed you know, receive their glorified bodies and enter into their glorification at the coming of Christ, uh, they will never sin again. There will never be a possibility for sin to take place again. So the question has to be asked, well, why didn't God just create it like that in the first place? Why did he create Adam and Eve and then give them this command and say, don't eat of this tree, you know, if it wasn't even possible for them to to fall? And uh, because he could have created them with conditions so that it would be impossible for them to disobey. He wouldn't even need to give that command because they would automatically always do what is right and good and true reflecting the moral character of God. He didn't do that. And so why didn't he do that? Well, I suggest because God wanted to supremely magnify his glory to his image-bearing creatures and to the whole cosmos, but particularly to his image-bearing creatures. And the question is then, well, then how did he do that? Well, there's only one place that we can go. And if you ask, you know, just ask any Christian, where has God most supremely magnified his glory? Well, we would have to say it's in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ as the means by which God brings about redemption for Mm -hmm. human beings. And really to extend that redemption for the whole world, for the whole cosmos. And so I believe it's plainly obvious through the reading, just the unfolding of the drama of Scripture, that God has most supremely magnified his glory and the work of redemption that must of necessity be centered upon the incarnation, the the perfect life and death and resurrection, and we might extend that to the ascension and the second coming of Christ, the full gamut of his person and work. And that God has supremely magnified himself in the work of redemption centered on the person and work of Jesus Christ. And I then suggest that we can't imagine a world, we can't imagine a condition uh, of creation or any created condition where God could magnify his glory more gloriously than he has in this particular scenario where he sent his son into the world Uh, to die this brutal death, to rise again from the dead, to provide an atoning sacrifice to save sinners from sin and death and evil and the devil and all of that. And um, and so, so, but none of that could happen unless God purposed, not just permitted, I think it's okay to use the word permission if we use it in the sense of willing permission, but God purposed the fall to take place. God intended Adam and Eve to fall because that created a scenario where Christ would come and bring redemption to the world, bring his grace uh, in redeeming the world and redeeming a people for God's own glory. And by doing so, he supremely magnifies the glory of God. Um, You know, I think... uh, and if you guys have some something to interject there, feel free. But I, I think Ephesians chapter 1 would be one of the go-to passages, you know, that I would go to, um, you know, that I think sets a framework for understanding, you know, what God is doing in the world. You know, in starting verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. We see Paul use this in Christ, in him phrase, you know, a lot throughout his letters, but particularly in this passage, verses 3 through 14, you know, Christ is very central to everything that he says here. Um, He says, just as he chose us in him, again, in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love, he predestined us. Uh, to adoption as sons through uh, through Christ Jesus to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. I think that's really important, that phrase there. According to the kind intention of his will. In other words, God has a sovereign will. He has a sovereign plan, a sovereign purpose, and it, it's one that reflects his kindness. It's one that reflects his love and his mercy, his grace, we might even say, Um, And then verse 6 just brings that whole notion home. He says, To the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. And there you have, I think, a a key verse there that why did he do this? Why did he choose us in Christ? Why did he create us in the first place, you know, and redeem us in Christ? It is to the praise of the glory of his grace. Mm hmm which he repeats uh, multiple times. Yeah, He right. repeats that many times throughout this passage, verse 7, in him we have redemption <clears throat> through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Right? So this whole work of redemption, this whole work of God bringing glory is centered on his grace, we might say, and that grace must of necessity be centered on the person and work of Christ, who is the Redeemer, who is the one that... that that accomplishes everything necessary for God to extend his grace to undeserving rebels. And that's what he's done. Yeah. Thank you for that, Scott. I, I just wanted to, um, to ask a, a clarifying question. If I could summarize it this way, that the um, um, greater glory defense would, uh, in my own words, I suppose, but uh, I'd love for you to interact with this, that God in his manifold and infinite wisdom, um, determine that this world, in the way that it is conditioned, created, in the way that it's unfolding, this is the way um, for him to see maximal glory, to express his glory in a maximal sense, including, would this be fair to say, including the necessity of the existence of evil for the accomplishing of that purpose? Yes, yeah, so so I think the, the way to say this is that once God, in his sovereign freedom, chose not just to display his glory, right? Because God's glory was displayed in unspoiled Eden, right? And and if God had chosen to, to let Eden stay in its unspoiled condition and it had Adam and Eve populate the world with, with you know, with, you know, perfect, sinless, uh, people, God's glory would have certainly been displayed in such a world, but it would not have been supremely displayed. And that's my argument. The only way that God supremely displays his glory is by purposing the fall to take place. And once he decided that that his purpose was to supremely magnify his glory or to magnify his glory maximally, then that necessitated the fall. So the, the the fall is not an intrinsic necessity. God did not he did not have to have the fall take place. Why did he take have the fall take place? Because without the fall, God could not supremely magnify his glory, and his glory is most supremely magnified in the work of redemption and the work of redemption of sinful human beings and of a, of, a, of a cursed cosmos can only take place through the person and work of the incarnate, you know, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hmm. There's no other way. There's no other way that the world can be redeemed. There's one name given in heaven by which men must be saved, you know, Acts 4, 12, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> kind of yeah. mm-hmm. messing that verse up a mm-hmm. little bit. But, but you know, and, and that's what he says. If you go on in the Ephesians passage, he says— I'm reading from New American Standard. It's a little bit, um, it, it's uh, it's a little bit strange. This verse in verse ten, he says, "With a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times." Um, 
there's a better translation for that phrase. It, it's really um, so that he would bring about the plan of the ages to fulfillment. And very importantly, to translate that. yeah, God did not react to the fall by creating redemption yes. as if it was after the fact, but right. the fall was a part of his eternal sovereign freedom and purpose so that it was folded into that before the foundation of the world is another phrase, yes. right? We see regularly, especially in Paul, uh, but, but that it, the redemption was not formulated, uh, you know, the, 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 the um, Trinity did not need to have a holy huddle uh, when, when Adam and yeah, Eve uh, right. ate their fruit. Now, now what yes. are we going to do? <laughs> exactly. uh, we need to hatch a plan. Holy Spirit, son, get on a plan. Yeah, get son, a plan. what do you got? Jesus, what do you got? Yeah, 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 <laughs> what, do you, yeah. what do you think, Holy yeah. Spirit? Uh, yeah, no, they, no, yeah, no, no, no. Uh, wow, that didn't go the way we thought it would. <laughs> yeah, that, that didn't take long. That didn't take <laughs> yeah, long. Yeah, yeah. Why, why didn't we wow, see we that one coming? Who put the tree in the garden? What was that all about? No. Yeah. Uh, that was all the, the again the sovereign yeah. free will and to, like we we would like to be able to say perhaps um, yeah. oh no I think I could think of another way in which his glory could be supremely manifested to which we would need to yeah. look at a Romans nine or other places which is to sure. just hush <laughs> your yeah. mouth with uh, the potter uh, and the clay right from Romans nine who yes. are you to say why have you made me this way and we if we expanded that why have you made it all this way? Why, why exactly. have you allowed it to be this way? And it's not that those questions are irrational necessarily, but if not tempered and controlled with the submission of the Word of God and a yeah. belief in His sovereign free will and goodness, yeah. we may see tension, but but He does not. Mm. And, and yeah. we can trust that it's That's not good. what we in our finitude would, would ex, uh, you know, we would express it as attention maybe, and, and the Lord clearly does not um, as he unfolds yeah. his will for the supreme glory, yeah, for his supreme glory. What's interesting in the, in the Romans 9 passage, you know, people always focus on, you know, I'll have mercy on who I have mercy, I'll have compassion on who I have compassion, you know, God hardens some and, and, and whom he desires and has mercy on others. But one of the key verses in that passage is verse 17, where he quotes you know, what God did with Pharaoh uh, in hardening Pharaoh's heart. He says, for this very purpose, I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. Right? Mm. He is yeah, not using great... the words here, but he goes, I, I hardened your heart, Pharaoh, and in harden your heart multiple times so you would not let my people go. That gave me the opportunity to display my power through all of these plagues and, and these supernatural occurrences and ultimately the parting of the Red Sea that I believe was a true miracle. You know, yes, there were walls of water on either side and those people walked through those walls of water crashed down on the armies of Pharaoh. And let me tell you, the whole world at that time knew who God was and his power and his glory were demonstrated in hardening Pharaoh's heart multiple times uh, because that's his purpose. His purpose is to magnify his glory. Hmm. And it's almost like there's little pictures in redemptive history of the big picture plan of God. Yes. Yes. If I were to write a, a sequel to my... <laughs> oh, Ooh, yes. Tell sequel, us. We want to be on I the cutting edge. At, yeah. I would look at the multiple stories of that follow what I call this U-shaped pattern of creation, fall, redemption, or just... You know, the whole broad storyline of of how a crisis event, you know, gets resolved through a story of redemption, redemptive stories. And others have written some things on this. But, um, you know, I try to picture a little bit with the Exodus because I think that's one of the most powerful instances of the stories. But you can pick any person's life, you know, or any incident in, in Old or New Testament, and you see this pattern where God magnifies his glory by coming in and bringing redemption in the midst of a crisis of evil, you know, a, a crisis of, of tremendous proportions. And God, in the end, magnifies him, himself through the resolution of that conflict, of that crisis. And, uh, and so this sort of conflict resolution motif, we see it throughout Scripture— and we see it in all great storytelling. I have several chapters where I deal with some of that. Yeah. Um, it's baked into the fabric of all great stories. And there's a reason that it's not just 
the way it is. This is yeah. God, God's image bearers who tell stories that even in even in the rejection of the living God would right. would uh, mirror in some way uh, that motif that God is truly telling. That that is the story that is true, yeah. right? Sometimes called the the myth that is true, uh, yeah. the story that is true of God's unfolding purposes. C- yeah. If can I take us in a, another direction here, just briefly, um, Scott, regarding what you hope to see. Christians take from this, right? There's one thing, and there's a certain value to just understanding the argument better and closing the book and saying, I have, I'm benefited by knowing how to articulate um, from a biblical worldview more about the problem of evil and God's answer to it. But what else might you say besides only a, a knowledge, you know, a growth in knowledge? But what do you hope this book would accomplish to the Christian struggling to comprehend evil, maybe particularly in their own life, right? Their experience yeah. of evil. And I'm not thinking natural so much as moral. Um, what do you hope this this would do? Uh, you know, you know, we're pastors here. Uh, uh, you're writing this with Christians in mind, and uh, what would you hope to to see the result be? Sure, absolutely. Um, I hope that that people reading my books will get this big picture. They'll get a big picture of God's work of redemption. They'll get a big picture of God Himself that they will see something of the transcendence of God, His holiness in the sense that he is wholly other than us, and that we can't compare God. We can't think of God in humanistic terms. Um, You know, God is not a finite creature. He is an infinite being that transcends, you know, all of creation and, and relates to creation uniquely as no one else does. And, and so we've got to have this big picture of God. Too often Christians have a very small picture of God, and he's too, we make him too much like us. And, uh, and yes, there are aspects of God's, what we might call his eminence, that are like us, but we need to have this big picture of God. And, and I think that, that it comes down to having true and genuine convictions as a believer of, first of all, of God's you know, comprehensive and meticulous sovereignty. There is nothing that is outside of God's control. If you believe that there was some evil event or some, you know, or just the cr- the crazy world that we're now living in, and it seems to get get crazier every day, if you somehow think that that wow, you know, God does not have any control over this. He doesn't even have a purpose for this. All of this stuff that's unfolding just seems to be purposeless. Then you're wrong, because God is using everything to achieve His sovereign purposes. And then, secondly, we have to recognize His all-consuming goodness. And so, when this comes down to the personal level, I think when when the believer really understands that God is sovereign in every aspect of their lives. And that we don't have to sit there and wonder, does God even know what he's doing? Do my prayers even make any sense? You know, and does God really love me? Does he really care about me? You know, um, we have to know that God has a good plan. Now, does he always tell us what that plan is? No. You know, you can read the book of Job. And, you know, in the book of Job, God never tells Job why he purposed all that crazy stuff right. in his life. Right? Mm-hmm. He never gives him an answer. Job Job asks an answer and God never God never tells him. You know, you might say that God's response to Job was I'm God and you are not. And you just need to trust me. Yeah. And yeah. you know, now it's hard for us because we always want answers. We always want answers to specific incidents in our lives where we're trying to say, okay, God, what are you trying to teach me here? What, what are you doing? God may not tell us. We may never know the reasons why, you know, my child died, you know, at age six or, you know, or, you know, I lost my job and now I can't find another job. And now I've had to spend the last two years taking some menial job, you know, whatever. You can come up with any crazy scenario 
you know, of your life. And as a believer, you, you can never get to the place and say that God has no purpose for me. God has no good that he is bringing about through all these incidents in my life. Um, we don't have such a God. We have a God that has such love for his people that he was willing to send Christ to die on their behalf and to rise again from the dead to give them eternal life. And he is working out a plan to conform them to the image of Christ. And he's going to use everything in our lives, both good and evil. Uh, and he's going to work it all together for good for those who are called according to his purpose, who love God or are called according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. You know, that, that, that verse has sometimes become a cliche, but if we sit and really meditate on that and really believe that and have deep level convictions about it, doesn't mean that we're going to get all the answers to the struggles that we face as believers, but we can be assured that God has some greater good that he is bringing about in our lives that is going to contribute to this overarching greater good, this greater glory that he is achieving for himself. And we find that our well-being, our goodness, our true satisfaction is going to be in God's glory. Whatever brings mm -hmm. God the most glory is also going to bring us the greatest satisfaction, the greatest peace, the greatest joy, yeah. the, the no, greatest great sense yeah. of God's Amen. goodness in our lives. Mm, it's good. Boy, appreciate that, brother. I know that you're uh, you're condensing an awful lot of work into <laughs> yes. this conversation, and we will again be sure that our uh, listeners have got the uh, show uh, the links in the show notes to both uh, the original and larger work and this more uh, condensed one, which itself is, is not um, lightweight. No, it's rich. Uh, I, oh, oh man, I, and, yeah. and even the one I'm working through now is 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 rich and and really covers so much material. I just imagine you just forced more brevity uh, in the second one, but covering so many topics. So, uh, uh, Pastor Scott, any any last words as you uh, have absorbed this and we've been blessed by this? Just a, a, a word of gratitude, Scott, for your work and um, for uh, a help in an area that needs just more attention. Um, and, and like you, you're you're the guy. You're at least one of the main guys uh, that that are writing these kind of books on a public, uh, a more just uh, public level, I guess. Um, so, just super appreciate your time and uh, grateful for your writing and look forward to that next book you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, it's, you know, I've been, I've been surprised at the level of attention that, that these books have generated and uh, I'm just humbled by it. And, you know, I just, you know, I hope that, that if people get a bigger view of God and can begin to see some of these pieces of the puzzle fall together for them in a way that brings them encouragement, brings them hope, takes away some of the fear and the anxiety that I think a lot of people are living with today, then 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 I feel like it's been been successful. <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, yeah, it's good. Amen, yeah, brother. Thank you. Thank you again for your time. It's a pleasure to meet you on this forum here. And uh, listeners, uh, for those of you needing uh, some more a robust um, understanding, cannot commit enough to you. These two works, choose one of them, go through them slowly, get a, get a partner to go through them with and wrestle through this together and trust the Lord for sovereign goodness. And um, we look forward to seeing you next time. You've been listening to Doxologic, a podcast by Doxa Church in Rockland, California. To learn more, visit us online at doxa.church.